their progress. played their violins in the filthy ghettos and squalid work camps of Nazi Germany. They played as their families, friends, neighbors.
Boker Tov, everyone. Ooh, I better stand back. It's so great to see you this morning. Maybe this one. Which microphone should I use? But it's reverberating. Got it. Okay. Before we begin this program and I introduce you to our very, very special guest. I want to also introduce you to some people who are here very special today. First, and I have them wave, Nikki and Micah Eigler, parents of Dahlia, Gra proud grandparents, David and Michelle Spiegel. Welcome, happy to see you this morning. Violin teacher extraordinaire, Beth Elliott. So happy you're here to join us. And Dr. Robert Rido is our special guest. Where are you, Robert? Good to see you this morning. It's my honor. I've been waiting 21 months, almost two years, to introduce you to this wonderful woman. Charming, an optimist, an inspiration. An individual who knows how to bring light to the darkest time in history is Suzanne Rido. Suzanne is the chair of Violins of Hope, Los Angeles County. And you will see today how the violin is a symbol of Jewish hope and resilience. Suzanne was born just six days before the Nazi occupation of Hungary in March of 1944. Her childhood experience and difficult escape from communist Hungary in the late 1950s has left her with an unwavering spirit of optimism and perseverance. Her memoir, a beautiful book, I'm gonna ask her to sign my copy, Pursuit of Freedom, and I hear she has another book coming out, recounts the story of her early life during this very turbulent era. Being a grateful child supporter of the Holocaust Bringing violence of hope to Los Angeles community is her way of giving back. Suzanne, you have no idea how you have captured my heart and my soul. Suzanne Rido. Good morning, everybody. And Tamar, thank you so much for that very meaningful, important introduction. And I am thrilled to look out at you with your great leadership and organization to have as many kids under the current circumstances. What I'd like to do since you've been prepared with the violins in some way, I would like you to see the film first so you will have a background on violins of hope per se. It's one thing to know about violins, but it's another thing to know about violins of hope specifically. And once you see the film, any questions you may have, I am here to answer those for you. The most important thing is for you, the next generation, to learn about our history and learn about it in a unique way through music, because what better way than that? So if we're ready, would you please show the film? They played their violins in the filthy ghettos and squalid work camps of Nazi Germany. They played as their families, friends, neighbors, and strangers walked to their deaths. They played for their lives and to keep hope alive. The musicians who played are long gone, most perishing in the brutal Holocaust. But miraculously, some of their instruments survived. Scarred, beaten by weather, and sometimes in pieces, 
A few of these long forgotten violins were restored to life by a remarkable master violin maker in Tel Aviv, Israel. It's about 15 years, 16 years, that I'm looking everywhere in the world for the violins who survived the Holocaust. And people are proposing me instruments so I can get this special instrument here in Israel, restoring them, and bring them for all the concerts that we are doing. Because it's very important to stay on the stage and to play on this instrument. This is the voice from another world. This is a voice that is lost completely. If you think about it, just over 70 years ago, Jewish people were not allowed to play. Only in camps, under the most terrible conditions. Today, we take these instruments to the biggest stages in the world. Look, the Nazis are not anymore. The violins, they are. And the violin are playing. And when they are playing, this is victory. And when it is victory, you cannot take it away. Though their owners' voices were silenced by hatred and cruelty, Amnon vowed these violins would one day speak for them. In 2015, the violins did speak triumphantly. Played by student musicians and a world-renowned violin virtuoso inside a classroom. Each violin like that that you are going to play is for millions of people that are dead. The sound that you hear today, that is victory. And each concert is a victory. Thank you very much. And I think this will give you a little bit of a flavor of what this project is all about. This was Amnon Weinstein's dream to gather and restore the violins. And as he said, he has many close to 400 violins in his workshop. And so far, he and his son, Ashi, restored about 80 of them. If you can imagine, and I brought you a few violins a couple of them playable, and one of them is in very bad condition. But I wanted you to see what the violins look like. Many of them, this is what they started out with, and then eventually they became beautiful, playable violins. This is what the restoration has done. And is there anybody who has any questions? Yes. Please speak up because I No, only about half of them have Jewish star. I think Dahlia has the instrument. The Jewish star on the back represents the klezmer culture. The klezmer culture was like the folk music or the jazz music of Russia and Poland. Maybe come around Dahlia and show everybody that everybody can see it. 
And uh, that represented that particular culture. Those instruments came in many different ways. Almost every Jewish home had one of those instruments. In those days, you couldn't have paintings on the wall and they had instruments to decorate the walls. And on some of the instruments, you can see the back and the front are different color. They had it face the sun and it bleached it. So the front and the back of the instrument are not exactly the same color. But these represent a culture that was silenced during the war. And in the middle 70s, we are, and since the middle 70s, we are now enjoying a revival. And this is what you would consider similar to Fiddler on the Roof, that type of plasma music that brings joy and excitement into our lives. <clears throat> I just give you a little background because you might be wondering what brought me to do this Violins of Hope project. My husband and I are both survivors. And for us, this is a very personal mission, if you want to call it that, because it's very important to know our history. If you don't know your history, how can you love your culture? How can you love your religion? So in order for everybody to learn, unfortunately, this is not taught in school and you are very, very fortunate to have a principal who cares enough and all the teachers that she uh, influenced to want to teach it to you because without knowledge, where are we? Knowledge is power and knowledge is very important. I'll call on you in one second. And history is a very important part of our lives. And when you add music to it, how much better can it be? Unfortunately, you probably know that there are still deniers of the Holocaust, even after 80 years of proofing and showing all kinds of things. So we ask you to be the important ambassadors of information, you who have an opportunity to listen to us survivors firsthand, because soon I'm one of the youngest ones. I'm what you call a child survivor. I was born six days before the Nazi invasion of Hungary. So if you can imagine, this is a very important part of my life. It framed me, it molded me. My parents created the person that I am, hopefully a good one. And uh, it's very important for you to know what happened because this is not ancient history. This is history of our lifetime and I'm here to tell you. This is not the time when I'm going to tell you all about the story. I just really want you to know that music has brought great joy and often life to some of these musicians. Many of these instruments in the Violins of Hope collection have been played not only in the concentration camps, but in ghettos and homes, wherever they were listened to. And in the concentration camps, playing the instruments and mostly violins, and I'll tell you why, brought life to a lot of them, saved a lot of lives, and for others who were not fortunate to stay alive, it at least prolonged their lives. I don't know if you're aware, but in all the major concentration camps, they had uh, several orchestras. In Auschwitz, they not only had major orchestras, but even had a women's orchestra. So even there, we were represented. So with that, I would like to implore upon you to know and learn more about it. And if you have a chance to play music, it's going to give you more pleasure in life and it will only help all of us. And what I'd like to leave you with before I start questions, the instruments are a symbol of the Jewish people, the survival, the endurance, and the ability to overcome. And it's not where we came from, but where we are today that matters. And this is what's so important. Everybody has the ability to overcome. It's not always easy, but you have to work at it. So please learn <clears throat> that the violins have become a symbol for us Jewish people. And do you know any, have any idea why violin is such considered a Jewish instrument? Yes. 
Well, I cannot hear you, I'm sorry, especially with the uh, mask, but I will tell you, it's portable. When you were taken, all they had to do is shove it under their arm and be able to take it. And you may be wondering why there is a cello in the collection. It was not one of the instruments that were played during the war, but in the middle 30s, 1936, a well-known Bronislaw Huberman, a Polish violinist, created the Palestine Symphony. And that particular cello was brought from Europe as his artistic and rescue mission. And the man who owned the violin played in the Palestine Symphony, which later became the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. He was the lead cellist and played in it on that instrument until his death. So there's a lot of different ways of connecting to the Holocaust, not necessarily through the camps. And is there, there's a young man in front of you, Tamar. What, would you speak up because I can't hear you. That's an outstanding question. The Nazis, you may be aware, were music lovers. They didn't just enjoy music, they did something that was evil. When the people arrived in the camps, some of them who were the worker quality people who were strong and able to work for them, they were taken to one direction and the others who were somewhat older, children and people who weren't healthy, they were immediately taken to their to the gas chambers. And believe it or not, they were accompanied by music as they were going to their deaths. This is the height of evil, deception. And we have to remember that the Nazis were actually cultured people and music was an important part of their lives to the extent that they even had the Jewish prisoners create music not just regular music, but even dance music. So you know how extensive their desire for music was. Any other question? Did I answer your question? Did I answer your question? No. Any other question? Yes. Have you met Itzhak Perlman? Yes, I did meet Itzhak Perlman, and that's a very funny story. We met Itzhak Perlman about a year and a half ago when he was here, but about 40 years ago, we were on a family trip to Israel, and we were sitting having lunch in a Bedouin tent, and who but Itzhak Perlman and his family walked in, and you know, he was with the polio effect, he was walking up with crutches, and who was there, our guide, and he were classmates in school. So they immediately joined and we had lunch together. So we didn't just meet him on a social basis, but we spent lunch with him in 1979. So that's like 40, 41, 42 years ago. So Itzhak Perlman is a very important person. And I must tell you, Itzhak Perlman lived across the street from the violin workshop that you saw Amnon Weinstein and Amnon Weinstein gave him his first violin at age four. So there's a very important connection. Excuse me, one second of technology. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes. Please speak up and maybe pull your mask off for a minute because I can't hear. Why did Jews play the violin? I think violin is a music, is an instrument that you hold close to your heart. As you know, you hold it like that. It's small, it's portable, and it can sing or cry. I don't play the violin, but I love listening to it. And violin can be a very easy instrument to play if you know how to, because I believe it's hard to learn. Uh, but it's one of those instruments that are small enough. And whenever Jewish people had to flee or get away, escape, the instrument was small enough to take. And it gave them, as I mentioned to you, often it gave them life. Yes. 
I don't know how far we can go. You stop, uh, Tamar. Yes. You know, that is a very, very big question. Forgive or forget. You know, life has to go on and we have to in some way forget. I mean, forgive. It doesn't mean that we forget. It doesn't mean that the story and the influence of it leave you altogether. You must remember, but you have to forgive. Unfortunately, we cannot and should not harbor our hatred. We need to learn to live respectfully with each other. And some people may not be as nice as you would like them to be. I think it's important to at least communicate. And that's one of the reasons why knowing a little bit about our history, about the Violence of Hope project, what it uh, tries to achieve, you can be much better prepared to confront the denier, the hater, and hopefully with your knowledge, you can stand up and say, no, that is not the way it was. And we need to respectfully disagree perhaps, but at the same time, we don't have to love or hate each other. We just need to respect one another. And I think that's one of the important lessons in life is to learn to overcome adversity, but it doesn't mean that you forget it. And it can be in the back of your mind. You can imagine I've had a very, tough life, unfortunately, politically. I had been in prison as a five-year-old. My parents and I were in a communist concentration camp for 29 months. And here I am always with a smile, especially being married to a dentist. A smile is a very important part of our lives. So I could really be a bitter person, but I choose not to be. And my parents always said, learn from the past, don't let it weaken you, let it be a strengthener and make sure that you look forward to a better tomorrow. And that is really a lesson in life. And I think it's important to know that positive thinking is an important part. And I must tell you, you know the saying, a cup is half full or half empty. In my life, it's never half empty it's always half full. So I think that's a good way to look forward to a life ahead of you and with positive attitude. And I'll just share one silly thing that my father taught me a hundred years ago, the difference between a pessimist and an optimist. I'm sure you know each one and I'm sure you're, we're surrounded by people. The pessimist sees a problem in every opportunity and the Optimist sees the opportunity in every problem. And I think that's a lesson in life, one to remember well. And hopefully I've answered any of your questions. And now I think we need to look forward to Dahlia playing, who's also playing on one of our violins. So thank you for listening. And if you have any other questions, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Suzanne, for, uh, for being here today, for being with us, for sharing your story, uh, for sharing the story of Violins of Hope with all of us. Um, students of Valley Best Shalom Day School, I want you to just close your eyes for a moment and etch this moment in your memory. This is an incredible blessing to be in this room today, to hear from Suzanne to learn about Violins of Hope, the story, the story of perseverance, the story of hope, of continuing to hold on to hope and to know that we can persevere. And what, what a way to do that, not only to learn to meet Suzanne and to hear her story and to learn the story of Violins of Hope, but to have the opportunity to do that together. And I wanna to thank Tamar Raff, our Director of Judaic Studies for making this happen today. On behalf of all of us here, what a blessing.
There is no better way, I think, to sanctify this moment than to have one of our students, one of our students here, the Rabbi Harold M. Showweiss Valley Beth Shalom Day School, play violin for us and not only play, but play on one of the restored violins. Such an incredible message that Jewish children take these violins that have survived the horrors of the Holocaust, have been restored, and now today is being played by one of our students. And so it's my honor and my privilege to present a student of ours in our fourth grade who's been playing violin for three years, has been awarded a merit scholarship uh, for violin, is the first chair and concert master in an orchestra and plays in two orchestras. And in addition to all of that, she is a wonderful friend to her classmates, excellent student and a mensch of a person. Ladies and gentlemen, students, parents, grandparents, join me in welcoming Dahlia Eichler to the stage. Speaking of hope, the hope, the hope, Dahlia is going to begin by playing for us Hatikva. And so we're going to ask everyone to rise. Following Hatikva, we'll all be seated and Dahlia will continue with her second piece of Hava Nagila.
Natalia. You are terrific. Thank you so much. You really, you really, really brought that violin to life. So proud of you. you gave us both hope with Hatikva and you brought us such happiness with playing Hava Nagila. So thank you so much. We're so proud of you. Um, I want to present to Suzanne a few gifts on behalf of the day school so she doesn't forget so she doesn't forget us and we'll always remember how supportive we are of her program. We have all kinds of goodies for you. One of the cutest, of course, is a musical pencil <laughs> with our school name. We have all kinds of things for you. So come on up, please. I put them all in this bag. Oh, and, and it matches you perfectly. It matches you so perfectly. Thank you so much for bringing this message of hope to us to this morning. Um, and I know that um, before we end, um, if you would like to stay for a few more moments and ask any other questions. Oh, okay. You, uh, I think we should give it to her. Okay. This is... Um, a student, come on up. I know you want to give, give her something on behalf of your family. This My is goodness. this Thank is you. on behalf of um, of her family the family from the Koch family. Thank they just you wanted so to thank you. This it's a, it's personal from it's just a personal donation thank you to so the violence of home. Thank please thank your family. Thank you. And thank you for being so caring. And as I said, you are so fortunate to have a person like your principal, who is such a leader, such a uh, dedicated person to bring out the best in you. And thank you, Tamar, and thank you for all of your teachers who are following in this great leadership footsteps. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna um, dismiss you to go back to your classrooms. I also wanna, at the very end, also I wanna acknowledge both Sigalit and Bila who uh, I know prepared the students. So to Gevert Schechter and Gevert Nehemia, thank you so much for preparing the students with some lessons. To, right, and we also, Suzanne brought some books for each one of you. I will, I think, deliver them to the teachers and then you can take them home today. So again, thank you so much. If you, um, I'm gonna let you all go. Let's have sixth grade go out first. Koch family, thank you. Okay. And I guess we have the fifth grade in the middle. Have a great day today, fifth grade.